Uh, truly is delighted to sponsor this event. Uh, it's, our, it's our first time here at the Industry Week. We appreciate Industry Week uh, allowing us to, uh, to sponsor, and I think we're uh, going to be here uh, next year and, and years to come. It's a great event. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody, every day, managing for daily improvement is our session. During this session, you will learn how to build a culture on true behavior-based principles, a true idea system rather than a suggestion system, and learn the critical success factors that make daily improvement, uh, improvement work. Uh, after today's discussion, our speaker will uh, entertain questions for the last 10 minutes. The speaker for the session is Jamie Flinchball, founder and partner of Lean Learning Center. Jamie is the co-author of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Lean, Lessons from the Road. Successful and varied experiences of lean transformation as a practitioner and leader have been spent at companies such as Chrysler and DTE Energy. He also has a wide range of practical experiences in industrial operations, including production, maintenance, material control, product development, and manufacturing engineering. Please welcome Jamie Flinchball. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, I first want to kind of start off by just congratulating the companies that are really the reason we're here. You know, this is the Industry Week Best Plans Conference, and most of you I know uh, were here for the, uh, for the awards this morning. Um, but I really want to kind of point this out as a reminder that those companies were awarded that, that prize because of what they accomplished. And you know, this, this conference is a great chance to come and learn something. But fundamentally, the entire process will be waste unless you take something and go do something with it. Uh, by definition, waste, waste is things that don't add value. You as leaders in your organization, your job is to add value by changing the environment, changing the organization. So I just want to kind of remind you that you know, it's only what you do with the knowledge that you gain here that's really going to make a difference. And so if you keep a, lot, if you keep a list of actions, you know, if that's all that you get out of this, is five things you're going to go do, great. That's, that's a, a list you should be keeping while you're here. Uh, now, what we're going to talk about, this is a, really a topic around lean, around culture, around transformation. And what every organization we talk to really wants to do is try to get to every person every day, get that continuous improvement environment going. And it really comes down to, I'll say one word, and that word is sustainability. Um, we'll see a lot of organizations, we'll talk about this, a lot of organizations get, can get started, but really making it stick, making it last, is really what the difference is. I've, I've been, uh, had the luxury to, to touch a bunch of different lean journeys, um, both from inside companies and from, from outside as, as a coach. And I've never seen a journey that has all forward steps. Uh, everything, you know, it might be two steps forward and one step back, it might be seven steps forward and one step back, but there's always backward steps. Uh, unfortunately, we've also seen companies that do one step forward and two steps back. Now that's, that's clearly not what we want to see. And I think more people get focused on the question of how do we get started than how we sustain it. And the challenge question to you is, well, if we're not going to focus on sustaining it, why bother getting started? Uh, we, we put a lot of money into training people, we put a lot of money into making changes, and then if this, so, you know, all, do all that work and it starts to slip back uh, a year later, six months later, or five years later, then it was really just worse. We spent a bunch of money and got nothing out of it. Now, just as a, just, I'll do a couple surveys here, and we have a lot of knowledge in the room here. How many of your organizations do Kaizans? Okay, that's an awful lot. Um, talk about those in a bit. Nothing wrong with Kaizans. Nice tool, very, very, very effective. But we actually measured the effectiveness of Kaizen in one organization. This was, this was back when I was inside the company. And we knew that we weren't getting the sustainability we, we wanted out of. So we'd see great improvements, we'd see 90% improvements in lead time, or productivity, or quality, or floor space, or whatever the target was. And we started measuring the half-life, which meant that how long did it take for, the, for half of the gains to fall back? And in this company, I'm sure it varies in different organizations, but the average half-life for those gains was five months. It means in five months we lost half of the gains that were, were accomplished in that time period. And then if you, if, you, if you another five months, you lose half again. And that would usually end up at somewhere between plus and minus 10% where you were before you started. Now, the reason it ends up minus 10% is you know, why, how you ended up worse is that you probably had some crutches that helped you hold up a bad process. 
you know, whatever it is that helped you get through the day. And when you made all the improvements, you took away the crutches. Now that you ended up with the same bad process, those crutches aren't there anymore. So the point is, is that getting sustainability is really about what daily continuous improvement is about. And that's really going to be our, our focus here. So the focus and really why this is, I'll say, in the leadership track, I know this has been a sort of busy room all day, is that fundamentally it's about people. Um, we talk a lot about organizational change. So how many want you, you want your organizations to improve? Right? We want our organizations to improve. Unfortunately, that's a, the wrong goal. Organizations do not improve. The people in organizations improve. And they produce all those results that, that go on to that. We, we put a lot into how are we going to change the organization. But every organization is made up of people. I don't care if it's asset heavy, if it's distributed, if it's labor intensive. I don't care what the environment is. But whatever it is, it's made up of a group of people. And the only thing that makes change in that environment are the people that work in that environment. So we, we have to spend less time focusing on changing the organization, Pick, pull, finding the big levers that we have to pull, doing the big things that, that we think is going to move the organization forward, spend more time focusing on the people, the individuals in the organization. And when we understand that every one of those people has a heart, a mind, you know, they, they bring that to work every day, that we have to go get each and every one of them. It's not about 5%, it's not about 10%, it's not about 50%. Each one of them is, a, is something that has to change. We don't change the organization, we change 100 people, or 1,000 people, or 90,000 people, or whatever the number is, that's the goal. So that's really the focus. And it's really easy for organizations to lose sight of the fact that you know, people have a lot more to bring to the environment than, than we typically ask of them. I, I think the worst example of this, and I, there's no way this organization did this on purpose. No one could be this stupid. Uh, but they had some very particular badges for their hourly employees. And on the badge were pictures of hands and feet. Now, nobody really knows, nobody had the real story about why the, that, that's the picture on their, their employee badges. But if you go ask the employees, why are there pictures of hands and feet on your badges? They will tell you this because that's all that we're asked to bring to work. You know, just bring your hands, bring your feet, you know, do the job, but certainly don't bring your brain because that's not what we're paid for. And this was the message that everyone had in the organization. Now, it probably had something to do with safety and remind people to wash their hands and wash their I don't know. You know. There's no way anybody could be that stupid just to put that on a badge thinking, oh, this is the message we want to send. But nonetheless, that was the message that was sent. <coughs> so our job is to, to focus on the people, whether it's, you know, whether it's frontline employees, whether it's supervisors, managers, vice presidents, wherever it is, each one of those is part of that change. Now, a little quick survey I like to do that kind of sets up where most organizations are with lean. And the numbers change every year, partly through conferences like this. But just by a show of hands, how many of you know something about lean? Okay, that's pretty much everyone. Now, keep your hands up if your organization's doing something about lean. Okay, a whole bunch more. Uh, now, keep your hands up if your organization is, you would consider yourselves wildly successful at lean. Okay, notice the difference? Just a couple. Now, that's the gap that really matters. And, and the point is that, that, you know, whether it's an industry week survey or just a little survey like this or, or actually going out and talking to companies, is that a vast number of organizations are doing something about lean. Very, very few are, are wildly successful. Um, now, let me just define wildly successful. Wildly successful means you get to change the game that you play. Uh, you, you change what the competition looks like. You define what service looks like. You can provide something fundamentally different to your customers, to your shareholders, based on your lead change. Now, a lot of organizations, and probably a whole bunch of you that didn't put, it, put up your hands, you've got some performance gains. You improved cost year over year. You improved quality year over year. You got all of those things. But are you really fundamentally competitive at a different level? That's what I would consider wildly successful. Now, the gap there is, the, the point is that Many, many, it's very easy to start lean. We, we made the barriers to entry extremely low. Now, five years ago, 10 years ago, certainly even 20 years ago, a lot of people were wondering, yeah, how can we do this? You know, I heard about this, I visited Toyota, or I visited Honda, or heard about it. How do we get started? And so a lot of people were asking the questions, how do you get started? Well, that problem's kind of been solved. Everyone kind of finds a way to get started. Um, I, one of the best examples I saw was a company in Kansas, and I went and visited them, and they were doing a whole bunch of lean stuff. And the only way that they got started is they read a book. They read a book, 
And they picked out a few things and they started doing it. And they learned from that and they started doing more and they learned from that and started doing more. And they were doing, they weren't doing half bad. A whole bunch of things they, they could have been doing better, but they weren't doing half bad. So whether it's access to training or benchmarking or coming to a conference or reading a book, it's really easy to get started. Unfortunately, the way that we get started says a lot about how we kind of end up. So let me, let me tell you, this is what I see 90% of the strategies for lean transformation. I also ask you to understand if that sounds familiar. Here's what it is. We're going to train people, we're going to do some 5S, or do Kaizen workshops. Sound familiar? Very familiar. I, I see this 90% of the time. That's the beginning, middle, and end of the lean strategy. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with Kaizen, there's nothing wrong with training people. But that certainly requires more than that. So if we're going to say, hey, we want to be successful in lean, then we can't use the same strategy that 90% of the other companies are that aren't yet widely successful. We need to look at it from a different lens. So that's really what we're going to focus on, or some of, what are some of those lenses uh, as far as what you need to be doing. And I don't care if you're you know, day zero or your day or your year 10 uh, on your lean journey. Still a whole lot we can do. So that's really going to be our, our focus. Now, let me kind of set up the why sustainability is so hard. And I mentioned the people part, and fundamentally it just comes down to the fact that people are, make decisions based on principles, based on how they think. And if we want to get every person in the organization to make decisions differently, that's a whole lot more harder than asking them to show up at a 5S event. And so the question is, what happens on your organization 2 a.m. Next, next Wednesday night on the shipping docks when there's a problem. Oh, how does someone at that moment make a decision? Well, they have to use their principles. They have to use their beliefs. They have to use how they think. And so we, we talk about principles drive behaviors. So the way we think, our belief system, whatever that is, our principles drive our behaviors. Our behaviors drive what actions we take, and the actions determine what results we get. Most change programs focus on just the end part of that equation. Let's take different actions and get different results. And we do that. We, we ask someone to do something differently. Here, do some 5S. Here, so set up this standard work for, your, for yourself. Here, change the layout of this equipment. We ask someone to take a different action, and they get a different result. And so then there, there we're good. We've gotten the script down, we followed the rules, we followed the actions, and we got a better result. But the next day, someone still has to make a decision, because another problem comes up. Next year, a whole other set of people have to make decisions because more problems come up. And they have to rely on, the, on their beliefs, their principles, whatever those are, to make those decisions. So fundamentally, we have to make lean just as much about thinking as we do about tools. Now, kind of explain a little bit about how this is you know, important and how it compares to a lot of the conversation we spend around principles and behavior. So how many of you have corporate values written down somewhere? And how many of you can recite them? Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, not a whole lot. Now, you know, a lot of you have badges now. We put them on the back of badges, so we don't have to ask that embarrassing question anymore. And I can just cheat. Uh, but you know, right now, if I if I ask you where to find those parts of those values, the first place I know is your website, which is just the modern day version of the corporate lobby. It's where we put stuff for all the people who visit us. So our corporate values, most of the time, are up there. They're up there on the wall for our customers. But we don't really spend a whole lot of time talking about what they mean to our organization. So a, a study done uh, not too long ago, it's probably about seven years old now, but looked at the, the corporate values written for most of the Fortune 500. What they found is that 48% of them shared two corporate values. So not a whole lot of distinct strategy here, but 28% of them had the, the, cor the corporate values of respect and integrity. So those were, those were there, 48% of them. Uh, now, one organization had those two, respect, integrity, and added to it communication and business excellence. Respect, integrity, communication, business excellence. Any of you know what that company was? I'm sure somebody knows. Enron, there you go. That's right. Those are their corporate values. Now, here's the problem with that. Not Enron, but the corporate values. No one comes to work saying, well, I was going to work in integrity, or out of integrity, but it's a corporate value. So instead, I'll work in integrity today. No one's going to look at that value and make that decision because it's a corporate value. They either came with integrity or they didn't come with integrity. So the point is, is if we're going to focus on behaviors, 
They have to be behaviors that help us make decisions differently than we might otherwise make. That's when we actually get to sort of true behaviors. So for example, if I had, and the most important thing about this is that we develop common behaviors. I don't care if you have 10 people in your organization or 90,000, every person in your organization, whether they run a piece of equipment or they answer phones for customers, makes dozens or hundreds of decisions a day. And if I've got 100 different people with a different set of principles making hundreds of decisions a day, we're going in a lot of different directions. So what's important is that we build that on common principles. So we have to articulate it. We have to give people experiences that help, articulate, help them understand and feel what that principle means. And then we have to help them reflect on it. Now, for example, if my principle is people are inherently bad, and your principle is people are inherently good, we could be in the exact same conversation, the exact same situation, and make a very different decision. And so we can see what happens in terms of what happens in the middle of the night, what happens in the other department, what happens a continent away if we don't have common principles. So let me relate this to, to, to Lean a little bit. I, I know that uh, probably, hopefully all of you saw Jim McCausland's talk this morning. Um, I, I actually predate Jim a little bit at Harley, so I was there uh, two or three plant managers before he even showed up. And on it, you know, Jim showed a slide, um, which, which you know, I talked about later, it has a three-legged stool. So hopefully you remember that. But there's three pieces to our transformation at Harley. One was employee involvement, another was statistical operator control, and the other was material as needed, which was our version of just in time. Now, I was, the, I was the lucky son of God who had to try and keep that just-in-time system together. So keep all the cards moving and keep all the bids moving and make sure everything got where it was supposed to get when it was supposed to get. So a fun job. I'm sure probably a couple of you in here have the same thing. And you suffered with the same things we suffered with you know, 18 years ago, which was cards get lost and bids get lost and things don't show up on time. All the things that happens when people try to put a system in like, like that in place. Every one of my bosses, one level up, two levels up, three levels up, said, hey, you know, maybe this is a mistake. Maybe this just-in-time thing doesn't work. Maybe this pull thing and these combine cards don't make a lot of sense. So let's go back to a good old scheduling system. You know, so at 2 o'clock, every Tuesday afternoon, you show up at the Kroger and you pick up these parts. And we'll just make everything work like clockwork. Of course, clock's never, you know, never on time. We're actually in an operation because things are changing all the time. So I actually spent some time observing. And I don't we'll talk more about this, but I don't mean just wandering around, but actually going and watching exactly what was going on, minute in, minute out, day by day, of the behaviors that people exhibit around this fairly simple tool. We had trained people on the tool, we put all the systems in place. Everything is the same way you would see it in most organizations today, except a little less electronics behind it. And what we saw was that no one understood the principles behind it, and they didn't exhibit the right behaviors. They exhibited the old behaviors. The old behaviors was, the old principle was, well, I can never rely on the Chrome room, so ask for everything I can get. So if I've got two bins with cards in it, what am I going to do? Take it out when I'm supposed to, or grab both of them and send them back so they can start sending me more parts? Well, if my principle is the Chrome room can never keep up and I've got to get everything I can get my hands on, I'm going to pull every card I can grab a hold of. I might even go print up a few of my own. Because I want to go send them back and get them going. And the Chrome room might do the same thing. Well, you know what? Those guys never know what they need out there. So, you know what? We'll make what we think they need because uh, we know better and we have access to the same schedule they do. And we'll make sure we've got enough of everything. So they start making stuff that they're not being requested on. And pretty soon there's big gaps. There's bins that don't have the right number of parts. There's seven bins when there should be three. And there's shortages over in another part. All the same things that people struggle with. And it had nothing to do with the tool, had nothing to do with the system, it even had nothing to do with the training. It had everything to do with the principles that people use, the beliefs that they carried to make the decisions and how that system operated. Now, uh, just as a, you know, a, a, another example of this, um, uh, we talked about something like 5S. So a lot of you are doing 5S, so I can use this, you all, all know what it. What is the purpose of 5S? Eliminate waste, what else? Have the right thing in the right place? Standardize. Discipline, standardize. Workplace organization. Workplace organization. Sustain. Anything else? Sustain. Housekeeping? Allows you to understand where your problems lie. That, bingo. Now, all those are benefits. All those are good things that you get. The fundamental reason is being able to spot problems quickly. 
That's the number one reason, the purpose behind 5X. Now, it can be a lot of things, but if I don't understand its purpose, you know, we, we train everybody, they know how to implement 5S, they don't know how to sustain it because they don't understand the principles behind it. They make different decisions every single day. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen a NASCAR garage, uh, but what's the floor look like? Spotless. You know, it's, you know, we say it's cleaner than our kitchen table. No, it's literally cleaner than your kitchen table. You could eat off the floor. It is spotless. Now it's not like that because the camera crews come in and take a bunch of pictures. It's like that because if there's one drop of oil on the floor, you know about it right away. You see that problem before it becomes a big problem. That's, that's, what, that's why they do that. If there's one washer on the floor, they see it right away before something falls apart. Now, I don't know about you, but I pull out of my garage and I, there's oil on the floor. I don't know if it's a new spot, an old spot, a step in the spot, I have no idea. But it's like that so I can spot problems quickly. As a, just an example, just recently I was over, at, over in Europe and I was touring a, a facility and, and one, of, one of them talked about a problem they had with a maintenance event. They had equipment down and these are very expensive, very complicated pieces of equipment. To the typical PM event takes about 12 hours, anywhere from there to 48 hours. So lots of stuff going on. And they added, and they were in the middle of it, they added an hour and a half to this PM event. Now that's not real good, and the reason is they couldn't find the one tool that they needed. They needed one tool, they're in the middle of the PM event, they can't find the tool that they need. Well, what they figured out is that, you know, when did we last work, work with this tool? Well, two weeks ago we PM'd another piece of equipment just like it. So they went to that piece of equipment, they took off the panel, and they looked inside, and sure enough, there they found the tool. Now, that problem has existed for how long? Two weeks. The problem has existed for two weeks. We don't find it until it's already too late and it's impacted our performance. That's when we find out about it. So if I, if I had 5S in place and it was effective, well, sure enough, I'd see that problem before it impacts my performance. Now, the reason I want to bring this up, up as an example is here's a tool that we get wrong, not because of the tool, but because of the principles, and here's the easiest place to see how we get the thinking behind it wrong. We take it out of the manufacturing site, we bring it into everyone's office. What do we, what do we start doing? Cleaning up, right? We throw things away, we, we get rid of things, and we start putting labels on things, right? So any of you have like a label around your stapler, says stapler. So you put your stapler there, you put your pens out, you put all your stuff out, and your, your desk is really organized. Now, it's certainly nice to do that if you're, you know, what a role model behavior. Hey, you know, I'm asking everybody else to do it, I should probably do it too. Fine. Maybe it's like, you know saves you a few minutes here and there because you can find the stapler instead of trying to figure out where it actually ended up. But in the end, putting a label around your stapler has virtually zero impact on your performance. Now, what are the tools that most of you do use? Information. That's the tool that you use. You use laptops and emails. Those are just the mediums. The, inf the tools you're using are information. So think about the information that you use. Here's what we want out of 5S. You know, get rid of everything we don't need, organize the stuff that we do need so it's easy to find when we need it, and when something's out of place, we know about that problem immediately. So that's, that's, what, that's, you know, that's what we get. So think about your information. Get rid of all the stuff you don't need, have all the stuff you need easy to reach at a, at a moment's glance, and you know if something's out of place immediately. Now, would that make a difference in your performance? Absolutely. Huge difference. Is that a whole lot harder than putting a label around your stapler? I mean, I can do that all day long, but that's really hard, putting 5S around our, our information. So the point of this is that you know, we have to focus on the behaviors and the principles if we're going to get lean right. Because I can put 5S in place, I can ask people to do it, I can have them put labels up, they can understand it down to the, the, the micro tool that they can use. But if they don't understand the thinking behind it, what behaviors that are supposed to exhibit when they actually use the tool, it's not going to sustain. In fact, the average life, and this is not a very uh, scientific study, but just my kind of wanderings around, I get to visit a lot of different places, but the average life of the 5S program is about a year. And in about a year's time, it's either dead or you have to relaunch it. Those are the two choices, neither of which are real attractive. So sustainability is fundamental, and fundamental to that is getting the principles right. So what we're going to talk about are 
some very specific things just to kind of help get that right. So how do we get that sustainability right? So we're going to talk about changing the leader's work. We're going to talk about management. So this is the leadership track. We're actually going to talk about management. Working on what's important, making the work visible, and observations. So we'll just jump into these. First is changing leader's work. Now, kind of go back to even how we get to this point. I, I get one of the most common questions I get, uh, whether it's people writing in with emails or just a, a, you know, an audience like this, is how do we measure lead? So any of you have conversations like that internally? How do you measure lead? So what are some of the things you've done? Shout it out. Throughput time. What's that? Throughput time. Throughput time, so, so results focus. Other things? On time delivery. On time delivery. Inventory. So a lot of results. Any of you measure uh, how many people you train or how many Kaizen events you've had? Mm -hmm. Yep, so a lot, of, a lot of head nods there too. So we have all kinds of conversations. How do we measure lead? Um, the easiest thing to measure, and this is probably true for just about any metric, you know, there's a difference between measuring what's easy and what's right. So it's really easy to measure how many people we train, how many events did we do, what percentage of the plants 5S, really easy to measure those things. I actually had a goal, when I, when I ran a plant, I had a, uh, actually this was before I was uh, running the plant, but I had uh, a goal, and the goal was run 100 Kaizans a year. So that was the goal. And of course it cascaded down to everyone else, every plant had to get 100 Kaizans done in a year. Well, the behavior that that drove wasn't exactly productive. Now, because we knew it had 100 Kaizans a year. So sure enough, you know, somebody would have a, have a meeting, it would last over lunch, you know, so it's kind of a long meeting, and okay, well, then we'll call that a Kaizen. Um, done, there's one. Okay, where's the next one? Okay, got another meeting over lunch. Okay, this one's over lunch, it's long enough, we can call it a Kaizen, there's two. And sure enough, pretty much people were taken off, you know, having Kaizens, and the focus on the purpose of Kaizen, on the results of Kaizen, on the, the benefits, was completely washed away. So it's very, you know, it's very easy for an organization to slip into measuring what's easy to measure instead of what's right to measure. Now, here's what I'd love to see as a metric. You know, if you if you ask me, what's the leading metric? You know, not a lagging metric, the leading metric of truly sustainable lean change. What I would tell you is that it's the the percentage of leaders' work that change month over month, quarter over quarter. Now, that would mean the number of leaders who we change their work. You know, so we replace this person with that one. That's a different metric. Uh, but I mean, you know, if you take your work, the job that you do, the things that you spend time on, how much of that do you change every month? You know, if you truly internalize, and here's the logic behind it, if you truly internalize lean principles, you can't help but to continue to improve. You can't help but to say, you know, I see some waste in my job. I've got to go after that. Just can't help it. We're going to do that every day if I truly internalize the principles in a way that it's now how I believe and how I think. And if I have leaders in the organization that have internalized the principles, internalized the thinking, they won't be able to help but do the right things to coach and lead everyone else as well. So now this is not an easy thing to measure. And please do not uh, go out to your organization and say, I want everyone to fill out a form that tells us how much of your job you changed last month and we're going to roll it up in some kind of metric. So please don't do that. But if you really want to study you know, how much is your organization getting lean thinking, look at the work of managers and leaders in the organization. Are you changing what you spend your time on or how you spend your time? That's fundamentally different. Now, every leader finds a way to role model the behaviors. You know, we find a way. Uh, just a story from uh, some of my friends in, in Ireland. And, uh, one of the factory managers, a uh, guy named Eamon, great guy, and he was a very passionate lean leader. Um, several thousand people, he would stand up and speak with passion about lean, and every time he'd tell a, tell a story of how he took over some particular process and drove a whole bunch of waste out of it, and the process was better, and everyone looked at it, and they're like, wow, you know, this, this whole process was pain for all of us. And now it's focused, it's streamlined, we're getting productive, it's good. And so everyone was happy with it, he was proud of it, and he constantly used it as an example over and over and over again about how he as a leader needed to step out and make the change happen. And then one day, one of his direct reports, a wonderful leader named uh, Anne Marie, came up to him and said, Hey, what have you done lately? Well, this struck him like a brick over the head. 
They hadn't done anything lately. It, was a, it just dawned on him that you know, he had done this one thing, and he had been riding that one thing for months, actually almost a year. He wasn't, doing, he wasn't out there every day trying to change the process. He wasn't every day trying to change the work around him. He wasn't every day trying to change how, he's, how he did his activities. He did one thing, and then went around telling everybody about it. Now, that wake-up call to him certainly changed his behaviors, because he started, got back on the bandwagon and started going out and making change himself. Not just encouraging others to, to do that, not just uh, demonstrating it, not just telling stories, but going out and making change to his own life. So it's not one-time gains, it's not rolled out of behaviors, it's not even showing up at a Kaizen event. It's how much do you, as a leader in your organization, change in your job every single day, every single week, every single month. Really hard to measure, but to me, probably one of the best indicators of long-term success. Now, just a, another example of this, I, I don't care whether you change the content of your work or you change the method. Now, either one is fine with me. You know, so we're going to talk more about observation uh, at the end, but we had uh, uh, started changing one organization, the content of manager's work. So this was an environment where the, the, the manufacturing environment is fairly, I won't say toxic, but certainly it's difficult. It's not something you just kind of wander out into. You've got to suit all up and do all this work. And so you, know, you didn't see a lot of managers on the floor for long periods of time. So they put a new policy in place. So again, actions drive results. So put a new action a policy in place. Everyone had to be on the floor for the first two hours. Well, that was interesting, but no one knew what to do there. So they started changing the, they started changing the content of the work, be on the floor, but they didn't change the method. So pretty much, instead of having the conversation in the hallway on the carpet, they had the same conversation in the, hall, in the aisle of the factory. You know, it was just a different location. Uh, it probably helped a little, because at least they were there, people could ask questions, but it helped very little. It wasn't until they changed the content of that work what are you going to do when you're out on the floor? What are you going to go observe? What are you going to go look at? What are you going to dig into? Then actually things started to change. So it's about changing not just the folks on the floor, not just how we put widgets together, not just how we run our equipment. It's changing the work of leaders. And if you take, you know, if you take the folks in this room, you know, one hour of your time a week has probably as, as big an impact as, you know, 80 other, you know, more impact to me than 80% of the rest of the organization. Now, I don't know which role you're, you're all in, but we've got a whole bunch of people in here. If you take a look at what would half of your job look like was fundamentally more effective, that would make a big difference. So it's changing the work that you do that really drives the change, not just changing the work of others. Now, one of the reasons I, I kind of talk about this is um, just the, the, the example of understanding uh, why things actually occur in your organization. Uh, when I mean that, I mean, what is the really cause and effect of all, of all the problems? So to do that, it really means that you need to be out in the process, you need to be doing the, ex the experimentation, doing the process changes on your own work. So I go to a lot of organizations that will say, you know, we've got management support. Now, management, they're 100% behind us. Problem with that is behind is still behind. Leadership is out in front. You know, so it's one thing to stand up and train people in something. It's another thing to actually go do it first. It's another thing to go out and, you know, if you ask people to go eliminate waste, go eliminate waste yourself. If you ask people to do standardization, go standardize some of your own work yourself. I had, uh, a long time ago, I had a plant manager who asked me a really good question. I'm sure it's a question you all struggle with. He said, you know, how do I ask, how do I get my first shift operator to do things the same way as my second shift operator? You know, I, I know you all, this is a difficult question. But, you know, does your, my response to her was, does your first shift supervisor do things the same way as your second shift supervisor? Do you do things as a factory manager the same thing, on, the same way on one Monday as you do on the next Monday? And the answer is no. Certainly we don't. So until I start saying, what am I going to do to change my own work? It's a lot harder to do that once I start doing that, not only more credible, I certainly understand the principles we're trying to drive much more effectively. So changing the work of leaders is important. The next point is manage, don't just lead. Now this is the leadership track, right? So we love to talk about leadership. Leadership sets it. You know, we, we, we inspire people, we engage people, we set visions, you know. Leadership's fun stuff. You know, management's managing resources, making decisions, being holding people accountable, that's eh, not as fun. 
And so we put a whole bunch of effort into thinking about the leadership stuff, and we forget all about the managing stuff. And the point is, is that we still have to be managers, and I'll start with the word accountability, we still have to manage in a lean environment. That doesn't go away. Just because we've engaged people, just because we've trained them, just because we've empowered them, empowered them, does not mean that management should go away. And I think one of the worst things that we've done is put leader into job titles. And no offense to anybody here, because uh, I was in one of my job titles before too. Uh, but we kind of said, well, leadership is, you know, that's, that's, that's neater. So we'll put people in job titles that say leader. And so it's kind of become synonymous with management. So it's either a synonym with, with manager, or it's become a replacement. So leadership good, management bad. You know, you don't have to look much further than, say, uh, you know, TV or Hollywood and start seeing out yeah, what our view of, general view of management is. It's not real good. So all good things are leading, all bad things are managing. And I think that's very flawed because we completely missed on what's focus on instead. There's good leadership and there's bad leadership. And the same thing with, with, with management. There's good management and there's bad management. Let's focus on what good management looks like. Now, here's what this, again, what this has to do with leading. Now, we ask people in our organizations, oh, we're going to 5S this area or put standard work into this process, gauge all these people. So we've engaged people, we've asked them to design the process, they've contributed to that, they've all bought in, they're really excited. And then afterwards, someone doesn't follow the standard process that everyone already agreed to. Now, this actually happened to me, I was visiting one organization, and they said, you know, we can't just, we can't get them to follow a the process. They had a whole process for what was a chemicals cabinet. And they had how it was going to be organized and how it was going to be replenished. The employees that used the chemical cabinet designed the process. They all wanted it that way. None of them had any complaints, but very few people followed it. So you know, the question is, how do we get all these folks to actually start following the process? Well, in your organization, I'm going to guess it's the same way as this one, is that if someone decides, well, work time starts at 7, but I kind of like 7.30, that's not okay. Well, everyone else has to wear our safety glasses, but I don't really like them. Well, that's not okay either. So there's certain things in your environment where you hold people accountable. It's just not okay to not show up when everyone else shows up. It's just not okay to be the one person that doesn't decide personal protective equipment isn't for me. It's not okay. So we'll coach the person, we'll hold them accountable, we'll discipline them if we have to, and if they still can't do it, we get them out, find someone who can. Why is it any different for all the rest of the stuff. You know, why, why do we ask people to be at work at the same time everyone else does? Because if not, a whole bunch of waste gets generated. We have to scramble, we find other resources, we don't get stuff done, a whole bunch of waste gets generated. Same thing with safety. You know, don't wear your safety glasses, a whole bunch of waste gets created, and it might just be you. So that's not okay. Well, if people don't follow the standard process for the chem cabinet, what happens? A whole bunch of waste gets generated. So why is it that we hold people accountable for some things, but when it comes to lean, we want them to just naturally show up, do the right thing every single day? I think we missed that. And here's the thing. Now, your, your employees aren't going to stand up and say, could you please hold us accountable? Now, you're not going to actually hear it in that phrase, but I will tell you, and you can test this yourself, people want that. All they want, they will, certainly are, they're happy to be held accountable, as long as, it's fair and not arbitrary. So if you hold them accountable for coming in, you know, coming inside and standing on one leg, you know, okay, that's pretty stupid. So I'm not really excited about being held accountable to that. But if we agree, here's the best process, and you want to hold us accountable, and I'm okay with you, know, I'm okay with that. In fact, I'm actually happy about it because you know half the folks, you know, or ten percent of the folks really want to follow the standard. I mean, they're passionate about it. Ten percent of the folks really don't like it at all. Everyone else would prefer that we follow the standard. Does it mean they're not going to be the only ones to do it? You know, if no one else picks up the garbage, they're not going to pick up the garbage. If no one else follows the standard, they're not going to follow the standard. But if everyone else is going to follow the standard, they'd rather follow it too. So we have to spend as much time thinking about the role of management. And managing is just as important. We have to pay attention to what good management means. Not just bad management. Management's not bad. Management's good if done well. And it starts with accountability. Put things in place, we have to hold people accountable to that as well. Next is work on what's important. 
I have to say, I, I'm not sure I've ever uttered a more obvious phrase, work on what's important. I mean, geez, why, why do I work on what's not important? Right? I mean, that just seems stupid. So here's what, here's what this, here's what's really behind this. Because when it comes to lean, again, we don't do this very well. Uh, any, of you, any of you ever participate in quality circles? I know this might date some of you, I'm sorry about that. So quality circles, now here's the premise of quality circles, right? We, we're going we're gonna to get teamwork, we're going to focus on solving problems, we're going to use statistical data-driven tools, um, and, and drive results. I mean, any of those things sound bad? Sounds pretty good stuff, right? The reason it failed isn't because the process was bad, it's because we said, you know, we're just going to form a team, we'll give you some tools, go work on something. And so, you know, the striking part of the parking lot team was formed. And the uh, better company picnic process was formed. And, you know, we worked, we had a whole bunch of quality circles around meaningless stuff. So we sent a bunch of people off with a bunch of tools, we didn't work what was on, on what was important. So here's where this really starts. I go to a lot of organizations, and I'm fine with actually advocate, you know, have a lean office or a lean committee or whatever that might be. Uh, have lean champions, have lean facilitators, have lean trainers, fine. <laughs> But, do those people own the lean program, or do they help make it happen? I'm fine with having a lean plan, but is there a business plan and a lean plan, or is there one plan that leans apart? So it's one thing to have, you know, have, have a bunch of lean stuff going on, it's a whole other thing to integrate it into the organization. When I say integrate, it means that I might have a lean champion, I might have a lean office, I might have a lean steering committee. But the line leadership, the operational leadership, owns it. If they don't own it, they can't get a lot of sustainability by having a committee on it. Don't, you know, if you need to have a lean plan to get going, fine. But if you don't start integrating it into your business plan, then what happens when your business plan goes south? Well, we start putting the lean plan aside. I think a great proxy on this, uh, as just an example, is 5S, again. Most organizations start with 5S. I think half the organizations that start with 5S shouldn't start with 5S. Now, there's a lot of good reasons. There's a lot of neat reasons that have to do with organizational change, because it gets everyone involved, and it's visual, and all sorts of nice stuff. But, if it doesn't solve a problem that people know about, fundamentally, they aren't that excited about it. Because they have real problems, and you just help them solve a problem they don't have. <coughs> Jeez, I understand what lean is. Spend a bunch of resources not making a difference. That's what lean means. And that's exactly what people take away from it. So if you want to use 5S, fine. Do it because the problems that it helps you solve are problems that you have. Now, I'm sure it can help every one of you. I'm sure 5S is great. But if you're going to engage people, do it for that reason. So working on what's important means picking things based on the problems that you have. Working on the stuff that's, that's important that helps you engage people for, for problems that they're really worried about. Problems that they're really working on. Problems that they really struggle with. Pick tools based on that. Pick problems based on that. Pick processes based on that. Throw your lean plan away and integrate it into your business plan. If you do nothing else, start there. As a test to your 5S program, you know, we, we, we talked about the, the, the purpose of it. If, you're, if you have an area that's doing 5S and you have audits, and if you know a better way to sustain things, I don't know, but they kind of work. You have audits. The minute your area goes into disarray, you have some quality problems, productivity problems, whatever it is. If you cancel the 5S audits, then you don't have the tools connected to the business. If you double the 5S audits, you probably do. Because if my area, my process is out of control, it has a whole bunch of variation and a whole bunch of problems, why would I want to add more variation by letting my 5S slip? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if 5S is a lean thing, instead of a solve a problem thing, Sure enough, that's exactly what we're going to do. We'll postpone those audits. Two more points. One, make it work visible. And what this means is, make it so that when sustainability stops happening, when we have breakdowns, find about out about it right away. Now let's take just in time. You know, here's something we've been writing about and talking about and doing for 30 years. Just in time. Now, here's the logic of it, right? We're going to take, we're going to streamline a process, get everything connected, and take a whole bunch of inventory off that was bad. Now, what's that inventory there for? It's there to protect us from all our problems. You know, it might be physical inventory, it might be capacity inventory, or it might be time inventory. They're all the same thing. We, just, we use those types of inventory to help us cover our problems. 
So if I start reducing my inventory, getting things better connected, taking that inventory down, my process is now more fragile. So it means that if small things happen, I break. Now, any of you think it makes a lot of sense to design your process to be more fragile? Not exactly a fun thing to sign up for, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I want things to break easily. It doesn't make a, we want robust, not fragile. Well, the reason for that is that the real purpose of just-in-time isn't reducing inventory, isn't better connecting processes, it's to make problems very visible so that we have to go solve them. And we have to go solve them when they're small. I'll just give you an example of this. In one of my previous slides, we had machining operation. We had two machines uh, steps, five pallets of materials in between. Because sometimes the problems were big enough that it took five pallets. But two pallets, in most of the time, was all that was enough. So, you know, we said we can't do just in time. We can't get it connected to two pallets because we'll never survive. So instead of getting rid of the tucks for three pallets, we put them in the other corner of the operation, behind the gate with a key. We gave the key to the operations manager. Now, you know, most of the days they operate, we operated with two pallets. But occasionally something bad would happen. And so we have to call the operations manager. They'd leave whatever meeting they were in or whatever uh, conversation they were in, come down to the floor, unlock the cage, and go see the problem. And that was his fundamental purpose, go see the problem. Because when he sees it as it's occurring, right then and there, it's a whole lot easier and cheaper to solve than tomorrow when it shows up in a report, or the end of the month when it shows up in a trend month. I can fix those small problems before they become big problems. Just as an example, I'm sure, how many of you have the scroll bar show up in your email inbox? Do you have enough emails in your inbox that the scroll bar has to show up? Do you have enough emails, yeah? Uh, I don't know many people that don't have the scroll bar show up. I actually have standard work for my email management, and I don't have the scroll bar there. And here's why. It doesn't sound like a compelling problem to work on today, does it? Uh, any of you, if any of you remember the first Mars rover that went down? This was, uh, this was it, it disintegrated, basically, crashed. $650 million error. You know, bad day, right? Uh, the fundamental reason, if you start tracing it back, was that, uh, that we used the wrong metrics. We used English or Imperial, and we should have used metrics, and there was a wrong translation. The real root cause is because someone sent an email to someone else clarifying that, the email got lost in the inbox, you know, because we have so many emails, and never got responded to. So too many emails in my inbox, and I can't find what I need, resulted in a $650 million error. The point being is that every big problem that you face today was once a small problem. It was a wrench that was hiding behind a piece of equipment. It was a piece of paper that got missed. It was a, a, a process that got skipped. Every big problem that you have today used to be a small problem. And when we can find them if they're small problems before they become big problems, we have a whole lot easier chance of fixing them cheaper and easier before they become big problems. Now the key tool that that skill that that requires is learning to observe. And what this means is being able to go understand our process for how it really works. So observe, you know, some people talk about, you know, going to the gamble. I'm sure a lot of you heard that phrase. I don't speak Japanese. I'm, I'm not, I don't see many Japanese here, so I don't use that word. I use the word observation. Go to where things are happening and observe. But it's more than simply walking out there and seeing stuff. I had one, uh, one boss a long time ago, probably one of the worst bosses I had. Um, and he, uh, he was so uninterested in going to where the real activity is. We had a big, long plant. His office was down at one end. The administration building was down at the other. That was a nice, big, fat aisle right down the middle of the factory. But instead, he kind of walk outside the building at this end and walk along the outside just so he didn't have to see anyone or talk to anyone or actually engage in any real problems. So that's one end of the extreme. So we say, all right, go to the floor. You know, go to where the work is occurring. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about management by walking around. So we send a bunch of people, go wander, you know, go wander around. Well, if I don't know what I'm looking for, if I can't stop and digest it, if I, can't, if I don't spend enough time to understand it, then it might as well be management by wandering aimlessly. Same acronym, but kind of the real point, you know. So, you know, wandering aimlessly and seeing a bunch of stuff, this might be nice, but observation means stopping and deeply understanding the problem. So, you know, whether it's, whether it's stopping and, and, and spending real time there, you know, we, have, we spend a lot of time arguing the needs based on the assumptions that we make. Might be based on experience, might be based on what we heard, might be based on an email. We bring a bunch of people together in a meeting, and we all argue about what we think we should do. 
This happened in one of the plants I, I, I was uh, leading. And uh, one side, a couple times, I started asking the question, how many of us have seen the problem? No hands went up. So we're sitting in the room debating the problem no one had actually seen. I'm sure this is the only time it's ever happened, never happened to you. It's a unique experience. So we set a rule. It might have been a little extreme. We said, you do not get an opinion until you've gone to see the problem. So, you know, it might be a little draconian, but you know, nonetheless, you, can't, you don't have an opinion in this room unless you've seen the problem. And after time, people started appreciating, appreciating why that was the case, because they went and actually tested their assumptions. I thought it was this, I went and saw it, it was something completely different. And that's what observation is really about. Uh, we could spend an entire hour just on this, actually we could spend five days just on this, but we don't have all day. And a lot of you have other things to observe tonight, like Harley's. So uh, we'll uh, pause here, we've got some time for questions. We've been asking great questions throughout the conference, and have been listening to some of them, so we'll get some good ones. This is your opportunity for questions. Just raise your hand, I'll come by with uh, the mic. <laughs> Gotta be some questions out there. With uh, lean activities and such, and you mentioned a lot of our observations with really, it, and looking for continuous improvement of process or products, prior to that is the design and process for the product itself. A lot is also discussed about FMEA in terms of process design and product design. Do you see or have you observed risks whereby you get the We've designed the process, it's great, um, there's not really much scope for improvement, and the sort of process design is quite continuous Absolutely. So the question's really around, you know, hey, we've designed it, it's as good as it gets. Yeah. And uh, we're done. And whether it's the product or the process, this behavior is, is, is very, you know, very broad, and this comes down to principles again, right? What's our belief? Are we designed for what we know today, or do we design for the long term? Now, I, I, have, I have three engineering degrees, so I'm, I'm actually a recovering engineer um, in a 12-step program. But you know, one of, the, one of the reasons I say that is one of the common behaviors in engineering is design for perfection. You know, we have all the tools to design and figure out every problem. Let's just do that. Um, and sure enough, you know, we learn stuff. You know, and so the point is, is really two things. I think one is we need to develop a culture and behavior that says, let's assume we know nothing. And so, as we start putting designs together, whether it's product or whether it's process, and let's go test them. Let's go find out for real, not based on what we think. Let's go and actually test them as easily and quickly as possible. I think the other part is designing so that improvement gets easy. So I, I had the opportunity to lead a design team for a billion dollar new plant. And uh, so we put a whole bunch of criteria. And one of the most important criteria that we chose was designing for improvement which meant that we had to design into the process ways to make it easy to change. So we didn't have every pipe wired down to, you know, here's where we should go, because here's where the jobs are going to go. Instead, we'd put all the piping in in a grid, so it always, in every bay would be in the same place. And we could always work off of that. On one end, we put no dock doors, we put no monuments, so that if we needed to expand, we could easily expand. Design everything in the assumption that things are going to change, rather than the assumption that we we're going to get it right. So it's in how we do those processes, and it's also in the behaviors. And if we don't get the behaviors that say, let's assume we'll never get it right, versus let's design to try to get it right, that's a very different set of decisions I'll make in the exact same situation. So that's the intent, is let's design assuming it'll be wrong, and then we'll improve from there. And the way we design it will have a huge impact uh, if we take that, that attitude, that behavior. Another question. Boy, you're know, answering all your questions, or you're really tired. It's party time. What's that? It's party time. <laughs> it is party time. Bus doesn't leave until 5:30, though. So, I'm sure, none of you will start until 5:30. Or, or 
I think, so the question is really, you know, where do you start? You focus on management, get that right, before you start casting it downhill, right? And, and I think, the, yes, the premise is absolutely that. Um, that if we really want to make a difference, it's, it's with management, it's with leaders in the organization. I, uh, we, when we were starting a uh, long, long time ago, we started what was called the Chrysler Operating System. And this was a part of our transformation of Chrysler. So we were nearly bankrupt, days away from bankruptcy. And seven years later, we had $13 billion cash in the bank. It was really based on two things. One is process transformation. The other was better products. I mean, getting rid of the fake car, really good suit. Right? So, um, so we had better products, and we redesigned the processes, product development, purchasing, finance, and manufacturing. And I, I tell you a little story around this. We had, uh, it was kind of a, a request of, of Denny Pauling. Denny was a co-founder, was one of my co-founders in the Learning Center, but at the time he was executive vice president of manufacturing for Chrysler. So he had 87,000 folks, and, and he wanted to do more education. He wanted to transform the organization through education. So he asked for, this, for a team to put together a plan for this. Oh, we're going we're to work with the UAW, we're going to put all these courses together, put together a manufacturing college, bring people in, take a few courses, send them back. And, and he said, great, go do it. And then the response back to him was, but that would exactly be the wrong response. This was a career risk move. Uh, you know, to, to get him to agree to something and say, but it's wrong. He said, the real problem is that we have to focus on changing leaders. That's really the problem. And so the way we did that is starting with Denny and Bob Lutz is, we actually started with cascade training. Now this meant you had to take a, got to take a lot of time, so time comes from somewhere, they had to commit time to this. So they took, got themselves out of other committees, got themselves out of, out of other activities, and Denny would run a class with his vice presidents. Those vice presidents would run a class with their uh, plant managers. Those plant managers would run a class with their staff. Now, if you're sitting in there and your boss is teaching you a class, it's a whole lot more impactful than if some other some head like me comes in and teaches the class. Because I, I know this person you know, understands it enough to teach it, so they're going to know if I'm going to do it afterwards. Secondly, if tomorrow I have to turn around and go do it myself, darn well better pay attention. Because none of us want to look like, like a fool. So it had a tremendous impact. And I could say, you know, I haven't been there in the past few years, but I visited a couple of the sites, and I saw a few friends there. And this is 1994 that we did this. Today, so 14 years later, the factories that have still made the most progress are the leaders that took that role seriously. You can still tell the difference 14 years later. So you know, my premise is you know, we have to focus on managers and leaders. If we can't do the work ourselves, really hard to go expect everyone else to go do it. So we give people education, and we hope they just kind of wander off and do it. Doesn't quite work that way. So we need to engage people a little bit deeper. And that requires starting with changing from, from the